Oh, hey there, mateys. Tis I, Captain Dreambeard, your sleepy skipper for tonight's snooze cruise. Some of ye may know me as the caretaker of the Sea of Dreams, a breathtaking body of watery wonders that dwells somewhere betwixt the waking world and the edges of eternity. The Sea of Dreams is wider than a mile of crocodile smiles, deeper than a conversation between two philosophy majors, and wilder than your wildest dreams, because it's precisely where your wildest dreams come from. See, each droplet within the Sea of Dreams contains a unique dream unto itself and the dreams held within its miraculous maritime mass are more numerous than the stars in the sky, or the grains of sand within the desert, or so I thought. But we'll get to that in a moment. But before we do, let's cast off the port bow lines, hoist up the jib, and set sail for slumber. Aye, mates, wonderful job, all ye. Terrific hoist in there, Boatswain Gilly. Oh, thank ye, sir. I've been a-practicing. I can tell. I can also tell it's just about time to get cozy under our respective covers. Let's stretch and wiggle our pirate toes. Now, take three deep Pirate breaths. You remember your pirate breaths, don't you, mateys? That's one big gulp in. And one big ar out. Arr. Let's try it a few more times. Take a deep breath in. And one big ar out. Ha <laughs> Another deep breath in. And another big ar out. Ar, that was perfect, mateys. Those pirate breaths are just what we needed to get our sea legs under us. <laughs> or perhaps more accurately, under a blanket. Now, mateys, if ye've heard any of me previous nautical narratives, then you know I often weave one whale of a tale, in that they're usually long and covered in barnacles, and once I get started, I won't come up for air for upwards of 45 minutes. But this particular story is less a whale of a tale as it is a cactus matter of factus. Because, you see, the sea barely figures into our fable at all. And while the ocean will certainly put this story into motion, the rest of what we'll receive will be just deserts. Excuse me, deserts. Just deserts. Because, mateys, this is the story of a magical place called the Drowsy Dunes, and how I helped a spectacular band of sleepy sheep get their groove and their hooves back together. This is the story all about Alibaba and the Forty Winks. Once upon a particular evening, I had just helped tame a sea lion's mane after an ill-advised experiment with bangs. They were a bit too harsh for his face shape, you see. But I got him fixed up with a good side part. He told me he liked it, but I could see he was lying. Get it? Cause he's a sea lion. Twas a joke. He loved his haircut. But tis a known fact that hairdressing's even more tiring than swashbuckling. So needless to say, I was even more pooped than me poop deck. After saying goodbye to me sea lion client, 
I put me beloved ship, the HMS Dreamboat, on autopilot and headed back to me bunk for some well-deserved shut-eye. But before I could take in a quick nap, the HMS Dreamboat had begun bucking like a barnacle bronco, and I knew it could only mean one thing. I'd run aground. Now, this wasn't the first time I'd run aground. When it comes to navigating, I'm second to none. But Captain Nunn is a terrible navigator, and I'm worse than him. Point is, I've had my fair share of shipwrecks. First was me starter boat, the HMS Hunkajunk which I may or may not have capsized when I rolled over a shoal. <laughs> and next, I had a catamaran catamatastrophe on the USS Rudderless. And then finally, there was me schooner, the APR financing, which, honestly, I marooned to avoid renegotiating the terms of my lease agreement. <laughs> but in all me previous shipwrecks, when me boat ran aground, me ship would be a wreck. But in this case, there was some reeling, a good deal of rolling, and a heapin' helpin' a falterin' flounderin'. But after a few moments, the HMS Dreamboat was back to smooth sailing. Now, a captain's bedroom is called their quarters. And after all that commotion, me quarters were a mess. But if I had a nickel for every time me quarters were messy, I'd probably have an entirely different kind of quarter. Regardless, I didn't have time to clean. There was captaining to be done. I hurried out to the helm, and let me tell you, mateys, what I saw dropped me jaw. You see, as I'd said before, me ship was sailing smooth, but rather than gliding o'er the tide, it was skimming across the sand. Before me lay a vast desert, stretching out as far as the eye could see, cause the other one was taking a nap underneath me eye patch. <laughs> I was mesmerized by the everlasting vastness of this space as the sands shifted underneath me ship like the sea of dreams I knew so well. I let out an awestruck arr as I realized I was sailing through the legendary drowsy dunes. Now I'd been to the dunes before, but every time always feels like your first. Here, dreams and time, thought and memory, would shift along with the sand, whether they be pushed by the winds of fate or by the winds of basic air currents. As I sail deeper into the dunes, me splendiferously dreamy beard began to glow in soft hues of turquoise and teal. All around me, the light from me brilliant bristles was reflecting through each glittering grain of the desert shimmering sands. The drowsy dunes seemed to experience a perpetual twilight, much like movie theaters between the years of 2008 and 2012. But here... There was never a break in dawn, let alone two of them. No, here it was always dusk. I observed the crescent moon travel cross sky before finally dipping below the western horizon. I turned around, expecting to see the sunrise, but instead... I was greeted by the very same crescent moon rising again in the east. Now, needless to say, I was quite captivated by this curious crescent, 
but I decided against trying to parse out the logic of its lunar logistics. After all, moon magic can't be measured by the minds of mere mortals. So in the end, or perhaps the beginning, I opted to mainly marvel at the moon's miraculous movements. As I ventured deeper into the dunes, I sailed past countless wonders. I saw the spiky forms of gargantuan yuccas, festooned with colossal blossoms on all sides. I saw a family of snorpions snoozing in a cave, click-clacking their claws as they slept. I even spotted a camouflaged roctopus tending to its rock garden, carving gentle, zenful spirals into the sand. Then, in the distance, I saw a faint, not quite moonish glow. As I got nearer, I saw that I was approaching a beautiful oasis with a grove of palm trees surrounding a deep, dark pool of fresh water. Right next to the pool, there appeared to be a 24-hour diner. At first I thought that surely this must be a mirage, but upon closer inspection I realized, no, this was, in reality, my favorite sandwich shop in all of the dreamlands. In the window was a bright neon sign of a sandwich, the top of which was covered in a dusting of tiny blinking seeds which spelled out the diner's name, Sesame's. You see, Sesame's was a late-night establishment, and considering it was always nighttime in the drowsy dunes, Sesame's was always serving. No matter how tiresome their travels, wanderers of the dunes could rest easy knowing there would always be an open Sesame's. And if you're ever lucky enough to pay a visit, you can choose from the most sensational subs, rapturous Rubens, heroic heroes, and holy moly hokies, each sandwich more magical than the next, and all of them witchcrafted with care by literal sand witches. The proprietors of Sesame's were three witchy triplets who wove fantastical food through complex arrangements of mystical mustards, rye bread runes, and spells a thin slice salami. At this point, me stomach was growling like a belligerent beluga, so I dropped anchor where the cool glow of twilight met the warm hum of neon. A small bell gave a gentle ring-a-ling as I opened Sesame's door and found a seat at the sandbar. One of the witches asked me for which witch I wished, and I ordered my favorite, an Italian sub. Coming right up, hun, the witchy waitress said. Now there's few feelings in this world purer than when a diner waitress calls ye hun. So needless to say, those kind words got me beard shimmering a kaleidoscope of colors, that rivaled any of Sesame's neon signs. My spontaneous light show seemed to catch the attention of the only other patron, a giant sheep slouching in the shadows of a corner booth. But it wasn't just any sheep. It was a bighorn of staggering size, by which I mean he was the size of a stag. As I looked closer, I saw the only thing more impressive than the size of this sheep was the history we shared. By me beard's blue light, it was me old friend Ali Baba, and he was looking pretty glum. Now, mateys, when it comes to sheep, 
It's vital for you to understand this universal truth. There's two things in this world sheep love to do. They love to ba, and they love to ska. And me friend Ali specialized in just that. You see, mateys, ska is a type of music characterized by a walking bass line rhythm that hits on the twos and fours. For more information about ska, ask anyone you see wearing a checkered vest. Now, the one thing that defines a ska band is a large horn section, and nobody knows their way around their horns quite like a sheep. Alibaba and his band were the greatest herd I've ever heard. You've probably heard of this herd as well. But just in case you didn't know, they went by Alibaba and the Forty Winks. And while most ska bands would have folks a dancing in their bowling shoes, the Forty Winks special brand of ska lullabies got folks a dancing in their dreams. That way they could dance the night away and still wake up well rested. In their heyday, Alibaba and the Forty Winks were chart toppers and pond hoppers, flying all over the dreamlands, sometimes by plane, mostly by giant albatross, and occasionally even hitching a ride between gigs on the old HMS Dreamboat. Heck, I even opened for them a few times with me ill-fated band Captain Dreambeard and the Power Naps. As we greeted one another, I could see the sheer fatigue in Ali's sweet and sheepy, horizontally pupiled eyes. I asked him what was the matter, and he hung his horns as he answered. It seemed that over the years, as the Forty Winks had become more and more popular, their touring, recording, and performance schedule had become more and more of a headache. It had become less about the music and more about the management, as their music sheets got fewer and fewer and the dread sheep spreadsheets got more and more numerous. Ali had struggled to keep everything organized, and over the past few months, it seemed that his beloved herd had scattered like the sand in a windstorm. As he saw it, they had all moved on to greener pastures, whether it be to focus on solo projects, focus on their family life, or just graze in actual greener pastures. But what he couldn't understand was why they'd gone their separate ways. I asked him when he had first noticed there was friction in the band. He tugged thoughtfully on his sheepy goatee before he remembered. It had been right around the time that all Forty Winks had their annual shear of the year, a special time where they all trimmed down the previous year's wool growth. Ali Baba had had the idea of weaving sweaters out of all the excess wool for every member of the band, with an individual number woven into each one, so it'd be easier to count off his bandmates and organize them. After all, he had reasoned, if they were counting on him to organize everything, it stood to reason that he should be able to simply count them back. So he knitted sweaters for sheep number one, sheep number two, sheep number three, sheep number four, sheep number five. As Ali continued his counting, it was easy to calculate why his fellow winks were less than enthused by this numerical nonsense. 
Oh, Ollie, I replied. Methinks those sweaters may have been a folly. You see, mateys, folly means a mistake. And Ollie had made a big one. It was right at that point our sandwich waitress brought over our sandwiches. As she walked away, the jukebox by the door sputtered to life as if by magic and began to play one of the Forty Wink's greatest hits, Don't Wake Up, Sheeple. On second thought, it was by magic. I just couldn't tell if it was mine or the sandwiches. As the music played, I explained to Ali that bands are just like sandwiches. Sure, everyone had a role to play, whether they were a bassist or drummer or a slice of red onion or a splash of vinegar soaked into the roll. And sure, they can be appreciated individually, but it's when they're combined into a symphony of the senses that the true magic happens. And as much as he might try, magic like that can't be contained. It can only be nurtured. So if Holly wanted his bandmates to feel like they counted for something, he had to remember they were so much more than just a number. You see, the sheep weren't just numbers one and two and three. They were John and Paul and George and Ringo and Carrie and Samantha and Miranda and Charlotte. Sure, sheep number 27 and sheep number 28 looked the same on paper. But in real life, they were Mel C and Mel B. And surely Ollie remembered that one of them loved sports and the other one loved leopard print. Every member of the Forty Winks had a rich personal life with dreams and goals of their own. But when brought together, they were all so much greater than the sum of their sweaters. The song on the jukebox and my speech ended at about the same time, and Ali took a second to take them both in. After a beat, he bleated, Oh, dream beard. I wish I could make me mates open up to me again. If only there were some magic words. I knew how he felt and told my dear friend that in my experience, from the farthest reaches of the sea of dreams to this back corner booth in an open sesame's, the most magical magic words I'd ever come across... Are, I'm sorry. With that, Ali gave me a smile as wide as the drowsy dunes themselves. Well, Dreambeard, he said, it seems that old Ali Baba is going on a ska apology tour. I returned the grin and offered to drive. We snarfed down our sandwiches, paid our bill to the sandwiches, and set off across the dunes. We sailed to and fro, hither and thither, crisscrossing the sands as the crescent moon kept time above us. Every crag and outcropping we stopped at, we'd find ourselves a new sheep. There were big horns, thin horns, orioles, 
Dows, Owasis, and Marinos, ex bandmates all. Each one Ali greeted by name, not by number, and offered a heartfelt apology for not taking their feelings more into account when he'd been doing his accounting. Ali even asked each sheep what they'd been up to. Turns out Mel C was getting into lacrosse. Mel B was getting into cheetah prints. And Ringo was helping the octopus out with his rock garden. After each conversation, Ali took a moment to invite his bandmates not to come back to the old band, but rather to join a new one. This time, they'd just call it the Forty Winks. And in a wink of an eye, wouldn't you know it, the band was back together again and all the denizens of the dunes gathered at Sesame's to listen to their concert. Ollie offered an opening slot to old Captain Dreambeard and the power naps, but I politely declined. After all, I'd been getting more and more into synthwave over the years. What can I say? I like waves. The Forty Winks took the stage to napturous applause. And oh, 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 mateys, let me tell ye, that concert was something else. Every member of the audience, from Sandwich to Snorpion, was transported to a dreamy dance party. The band played all night long, and considering it's always twilight in the drowsy dunes, it's safe to say they're still playing to this very day, or should I say, night. You know, if you're lucky, you might just find yourself at Sesame's this very eve. Dancing to the forty winks in your very own dreams. And if you do, take a second to order an Italian sub. You won't regret it. <laughs> 